Hello friends, I am Melissa Alfaro, Executive Presbyter representing Ordained Female Ministers. Welcome to our ministry podcast where we invite you to lean into scripture in order to shape your theology and practice as a minister and leader. Our purpose is to educate, enhance theological awareness, and create a space for our guests to have a healthy dialogue in regard to the theology of women in ministry and how it fits within our broader AG fellowship and practice. And I'm here with my friend and co-host, Lainey Vitalia, Lead Advocacy Director for the Network of Women Ministers. How are you doing, Lainey? Oh, I'm doing great. This is an incredible, incredible thing we get to do today. And we are delighted to introduce our guest today, Dr. Alan Tennyson, Assemblies of God Theological Council, Dr. Craig Keener, New Testament professor at Asbury Theological Seminary and leading scholar when it comes to Pauline literature and its exegetical interpretation of women in ministry. What an honor to have you both with us today, gentlemen. Thank you. It's an absolute honor to be here. Yes, I agree. Amen. Well, as we look at our AG fellowship, women represent 29% of all credentialed ministers. That's 11,024 credentialed women. And currently, uh, the most recent statistic was saying that we have 3,000 serving as staff pastors, 1,000 serving as missionaries, 660 women serving as lead pastors, 200 serving as chaplains. We also have female ministers training the next generation in our AG colleges and universities, and as professors planting churches in America and around the world. World. So our Assemblies of God movement doesn't just minister to women, but I love that since our conception, we have created spaces for women to discover their call and as well as be ordained and mobilized to fulfill the Great Commission. Since the beginning, women like Alice Luce and Sunshine Ball and Amy uh, Simple McPherson, they've been at the forefront of our AG movement, epitomizing the Great Commission as evangelists, as missionaries, as pastors. And even during a time, Dr. Tennyson, when it wasn't conventional or widely accepted for a woman to have a voice or vote, how is the Assemblies of God, take us back just a little bit, how have we always been countercultural when it comes to women in ministry? I appreciate that question really for this reason. Sometimes when I talk about women in ministry, the pushback that I'll receive isn't even just pushback from scripture. It's from, well, are we just compromising with our culture? Mm -hmm. Are we just trying to get along with the times? Is this just some kind of, you know, a modern contemporary view that we're Mm -hmm. trying to bring into the church? And I always want to point out, look, Pentecostals, believed in women preaching before the United States believed in women voting. Mm. We were not giving in to culture. We were countercultural from the beginning. Why? Because we thought this was the teaching of Scripture. We thought that if the Bible has given the promise that when God pours out His Spirit, sons and daughters will prophesy. If women can speak in tongues as a sign of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, they can give a message in tongues. If they can give a message in tongues, they can prophesy. If they can prophesy, they can preach. If they can preach, they can lead. It's the Holy Spirit who's doing this. And it wasn't put even in terms of men's rights or women's rights. It was really understood as the right of the Spirit. God has the right. He has the authority to call who God wants to call. I believe it was Amy Simple McPherson who said it this way. People always tell me they don't believe in women preaching. And I tell them, I don't believe in women preaching either. I don't want to hear a woman preach or a man preach. I want to hear the Holy Spirit preach, whether it's through a man or a woman. (laughs) Wow. For us, it was about the Spirit of God. Yes. That's amazing. I love how the Assemblies of God was never influenced by cultural pressure, but they were always being led by biblical precedents. Absolutely. I mean, it's been a Pentecostal distinctive mm. from the very beginning. And you know, we believe that the image of God is best reflected and the Church of Christ is its healthiest when both men and women lead together at every level of leadership in the church. And like you said, that's built on biblical precedence. And we use that biblical precedence to shape our embodied theology, right? It's that space between our theological, the precedent of scripture and our lived reality. And that's built on scripture, built on that premise. So Dr. Keener, if we can, I have a question for you as well. And and thank you so much for joining us. You know, Dr. Keener, um, as Melissa said earlier, he 
is a preeminent scholar yes. with um, New Testament theology, but especially in this space of women in ministry, he has been a huge voice for us across denominational lines and our world, and we're so grateful. So as we turn to the biblical precedence here, we know that our belief system has always been rooted in that. So how, how do we unpack a biblical case for women in ministry? First of all, you have so many examples of women in ministry in scripture. I mean, the most common ministry of the word, of God's word in scripture, if you take the Old Testament and New Testament together, is the ministry of prophets. Mm -hmm. And you have a number of women prophets in scripture. You have Miriam, the sister of Moses, Exodus 15, she's, she's called a prophetess. You have, um, in, in the New Testament, you have Anna, uh, she's paired together with, with Simeon. Luke, Luke likes to balance male and female figures. So uh, in Acts chapter 21, you have Agabus, who's an older prophet, and then you have the four virgin daughters of, of Philip, who are prophetesses. And um, you have Isaiah's wife, who isn't named, but in Isaiah chapter eight, she's called a prophetess. You have Deborah, who is not just a prophetess, but you know, people talk about the authority issue. She's judge over all of Israel. Uh, Judges 4-4 mm -hmm. in Hebrew it says she's a, she's a woman judge. So it, it, you know, it emphasizes the point, and, but it doesn't see anything wrong with it. It's just, you know, she's a woman judge. And then you also have uh, Huldah, who's a prophetess. She is given the same opportunity under Josiah to speak the word of the Lord for the state of the nation that Isaiah was given under Hezekiah a century earlier. And uh, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 11, where women are allowed to pray and prophesy. And of course, Acts chapter two, which, you know, going back to Numbers 11, Moses says, I wish that all God's people would prophesy. And then in Joel two, all God's people will prophesy, your sons and your daughters, male and female. And, and Luke uh, in, in Acts chapter two brings that out and then it's illustrated in, in Luke's own writings. So we have them as, as prophetic, uh, speaking God's message. We have one as a judge over Israel. And in terms of prophet judges, you've only got Samuel and Deborah, so I mean, <laughs> That kind of narrows it down. Yeah. And then in terms of apostles, well, when Jesus is sending out the 12, I mean, he, he was already being pretty countercultural, just having women traveling with the group. But in, in the case of uh, Romans 16, seven, Paul, when he speaks of apostles, he uses the, the language more widely than the 12. He uses it for himself, he uses it for James, the brother of Jesus in Galatians 1.19, he uses it for Silas and Timothy, uh, Barnabas. Uh, he speaks of Jesus appeared to the 12 and then to all the apostles in 1 Corinthians 15, five to seven. Well, among the, this wider group in Romans 16.7, he speaks of Andronicus and Junia who are of note among the apostles. And some people tried to make Junia into a into a mm -hmm. guy as a contraction for the male name Junianus, a contraction that's nowhere attested in antiquity and doesn't work with a Latin name. Mm -hmm. And so clearly she's, she's a woman. Uh, John Chrysostom noted that uh, in the early centuries and said, wow, he calls a woman an apostle. <laughs> so we, we have that. Now, some people will object, will say, well, okay, they can be apostles and prophets, but they can't be pastors because we don't have a woman named as a pastor. That's interesting. We don't have a man named as a mm -hmm. pastor either. I mean, in terms of pastor going with the person's yeah. name. But, but the two most common terms that Paul uses for his colleagues and naturally his traveling companions in that society were, were mostly male, but the two most common designations he uses for his fellow ministers are in Greek, sunergos, fellow worker, and diakonos, which can mean servant or, or minister. And in Romans chapter 16, we have both of those titles used for, for women. The diakonos is used for Phoebe, and the sunergos is used for 
uh, Prisca and, and Aquila. So a, a male, female team there. And it's interesting where women's ministries appear most often in Paul's letters. You have it in Philippians chapter four, and you have it in Romans 16. And these were the two of the most, um, two of the, of the cities in the ancient world that had, where women had the most freedoms. So I think it's not surprising that where women had more access to being allowed to do ministry, they felt more free to do it. And uh, also in Romans 16, you know, you have these, these greetings and Paul there greets twice as many men as women. But in terms of affirming the ministries, he affirms the ministries of twice as many women as men. So per capita, the women are getting more <laughs> affirmations than the, the men quite, quite a bit. Dr. Keener, in light of what you just shared, how do we unpack two of the most referred to passages in scripture that have led to misinterpretation and even misunderstanding in the body of Christ? That's 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35, which reads, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. And then as well as 1 Timothy 2, 11, which reads, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She she must be quiet. How do we exegete these two passages to give us a more accurate biblical interpretation as it relates to women who are preaching or in public authority? Thanks. This is like the first half of my, my uh, the book I wrote back <laughs> a long time ago about that subject. But in 1 Corinthians 14, to read it in the context of the whole letter in which it occurs, Paul can't be speaking of all kinds of silence because just three chapters earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he speaks of women praying and prophesying. So, you know, the context of this is gifts of the Spirit, but he's speaking of tongues for prayer, he's speaking of prophesying, and we already know that he's not excluding women from this. So what kind of silence does he mean? And I like to point this out to my friends who hold different views in this than I do. I'll say, in your churches, are women allowed to sing in, in the choir or, or even, even from their pew? And they always say, yes. I say, well, it says silence. If you're gonna make it mean all that it can mean, your church is in violation of this. But mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean all kinds of silence. It means a particular kind of silence. It can't mean praying or prophesying because he's already spoken of that. So they'll say, well, it just means teaching. Where is that in the context? Mm -hmm. what, what leads us to think that? You can't, the Corinthians couldn't flip over to 1 Timothy 2, which hadn't been written yet, uh, to, to figure out what it means. But he, unless he's changing the subject and then changing it back again, it has something to do with, if they want to ask questions, then let, their, let them ask their husbands at home. So it has something to do with the asking questions. Why are they asking questions in church? so that he has to say, ask your husbands at home. And why would asking your husbands at home help? In ancient lecture settings, it was customary for people to interrupt lectures with questions. And that was true in, in Jewish, Greek, and Roman settings. And there was one kind of question that was considered very rude, and that was the unlearned question. The question that you know, would slow everybody down because people mm. should know the answer. Well, why, if it's that the women were unlearned, why were the women less learned? Well, we've got two options. Either it's genetic, it's the lack of Y chromosome that, that makes them vulnerable to this, or they had less education. Mm. And it's pretty simple if you just start reading through ancient literature that the women did have less education. Mm. And in terms of women speaking in public, there were different views on that in antiquity in different, different places, like we already mentioned. But in, in conservative ancient Mediterranean culture, a woman speaking in front of another woman's husband was considered promiscuous. Mm. 
Uh, it, it, was, it was considered really off limits, just like going out in public with nude hair, you know, not wearing a head covering, which we don't require today, and yet <laughs> um, that's in the same letter. But it, it was because of um, the, the, the expectations mm -hmm. in that culture. So if you go to 1 Timothy 2, which is the, you know, it's the, that's the big one that, that people uh, often appeal to, there too, we're dealing with the context. It's in the context of two letters that Paul wrote to Timothy in Ephesus, where he's dealing with false teachers. And in this context, he first gives instructions to the men about not, not arguing, lifting up holy hands without wrath and disputing. Then he gives instructions to the women. And in those instructions, he tells them he, not to teach, but keep in mind that in antiquity, over the course of about a thousand years, we know the name of only a handful of women teachers of men of anything. Uh, philosophy and especially rhetoric were the two main sources of study. Uh, in, in Jewish teaching, we do hear of Baruria, the wife of Rabbi Meir, the daughter of a rabbi, who would talk about scripture. She was very well, well learned, but the other rabbis normally wouldn't listen to her because she was a woman. And for the most part, we don't have it with women because although women could attend synagogue, they, they were not taught to recite Torah the way that the boys were. So, I mean, throughout the ancient Mediterranean world, I mean, you, you have high-class women who would get more education, but the vast majority of women had less access to education, including in the Jewish circles where the education would be in the study of scripture. So you come to 1 Timothy 2, and what's unusual about it is not that it says that women shouldn't teach the Bible, but rather what it also says, let them learn. He says, let them learn quietly and submissively, but that was the expectation for all new learners. They were supposed to learn quietly and submissively. That's like what we already said in 1 Corinthians about the asking of, of questions. So what was the issue in, in Ephesus that would have provoked this? Well, if you take First and Second Timothy together, the false teachers are exploiting people to get out their false doctrine. And in First Timothy 5, verse, uh, verses 13 and 14, it talks about the widows who are going from house to house and they're spreading. And, and the, the wording could be translated in various ways, but actually this isn't in my book because I discovered it afterwards. Gordon Fee, shared with me that the wording there means spreaders of nonsense or in pedagogic contexts, propagators of mm. false teaching. Mm. And I said, Gordon, um, are you sure about that? So he sent me a printout of every use of the word in ancient Greek literature. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you go to, uh, and, and why would the false teachers target women? Well. Uh, it were, why would they target women, possibly because of the less education, but also why would they target widows? Well, where did the churches meet? In homes. And which homes were most often owned by the women? It was most often the widows. But especially you have in 2 Timothy 3, 6, and 7, where it specifically says that the false teachers were targeting women with their teaching. So. Is it a coincidence that the one text in the Bible that specifically prohibits women from teaching the Bible, even though they're prophesying the word of the Lord all over the place, I mean, so, so wait, you're allowed to speak the word of the Lord as long as you don't use scripture? I mean, that doesn't make sense. Oh, or, or, or in Titus chapter two, the women can teach women. So why can't they, uh, you know, if, if women are considered like they're gonna be easily deceived, so it's all right for them to deceive other easily deceived women. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense of the arguments that are used. But, but is it a coincidence that the one passage in the Bible that specifically prohibits women from teaching is the one 
pa passage in the Bible that appears in a church where we specifically know that the false teachers were targeting women. That way, if we take that into account, it doesn't conflict with all these other passages where you even have a woman apostle, where you have women as Paul's fellow workers who are, who are ministering God's word, where you have Mary in Luke 10, 38 to 42, sitting at Jesus' feet, taking the posture of a disciple. And that's not only in, in other Jewish sources like uh, Mishnah 1.1, but it's also the only other place where Luke uses that expression is for Paul sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. It's the posture of a disciple, mm. which could be a, a teacher in learning. But the, the pushback that you usually get is that Paul then goes on to ground this in Adam and Eve. And first of all, uh, because Adam was created first and then Eve, now in in Genesis, that doesn't seem to be the, the primary point, but to keep, to keep it short, I'll just talk about in Paul. Um, Paul uses that exact same argument in 1 Corinthians 11 for why women should wear head coverings in church. And yet we know he's dealing with the cultural situation of, of, of uh, sexual modesty in that, in that context. And his other argument, to, and again, just keeping it short, we could go into a lot more detail. But his other argument is, well, it wasn't Adam that was deceived. It was Eve that was deceived. Although, if you actually read Genesis, it says that Adam was right there with her. Yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. she's, you know, she gives it to him and he takes yeah. it too. So he, he's, there's a reason why in Romans 5, it's Adam who's particularly guilty because he sinned more knowingly. But is it an analogy that is saying that all women are more easily deceived than all men, and therefore women, women can't teach. That would have to be the way the analogy works to exclude all women from teaching. And actually, I've taught hundreds of students over the years in terms of biblical interpretation, testing their context skills, their background skills, their research skills, and in those cases, there was absolutely no way to predict who was going to be a better interpreter. So empirically, it's mm -hmm. not like the, the, the men are, are necessarily less susceptible to deception uh, and the women are more deceptible in all cultures. But sometimes Paul doesn't make an argument for all settings. He makes an argument for a particular setting. And when we look at how Paul uses Eve elsewhere in his writings, there's two passages. One is 1 Corinthians 11, and because of Eve being created after Adam, women have to wear head coverings. The, the other passage is in 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul says, I don't want you to be deceived as Eve was deceived. And there the analogy he's making is not with women, but it's with the whole Corinthian church which suggests that when Paul is making this analogy in 1 Timothy 2, he's not making an analogy for all women in all cultures. He's making it for the women there in that time. Just as he can be using it for the Corinthian church, he can use the image flexibly as an analogy for other things. That's so good. That is, there are so many different threads to what you're talking about in our different contexts. You know, we were speaking earlier and I have a friend who says, you know, we're not really true friends until I've been in your house mm. and you've been in mine, <laughs> right? Because we have a fuller understanding of one another when we see each other yes. in the fullness of our context. And I, I so appreciate what you did there to show us the variety of context and threads of the biblical narrative as we're looking at that as a whole. It gives us the fullness of the revelation of what Christ is imparting to us as we look through scripture, and it's critical to um, accurate biblical interpretation that we do that. Now, there were so many different pieces in there, uh, Dr. Keener, that would lend themselves towards even other topics of conversation. I heard threads of you know authority as Melissa was speaking. There were threads that you talked about learnedness and education. There's, there's so much that was wrapped up in there. So uh, Dr. Tennyson, uh, talk to us a little bit about you know, some of those other issues that we need to consider when we're thinking through the topic of women in ministry. 
I think probably the simplest way is to think of our theology of women in ministry has to involve a theology of women and a theology of ministry. Mm -hmm. So one, when we talk about women in ministry, what is this actually doing to our theology of women overall? How do we understand, and one thing I love about, can I, can I see this? I'm just gonna hold this up. <laughs> this is a fabulous book to read. Because yes. it's not just about women in ministry, it's also about women in marriage. And what is Paul saying about women overall? Because how we understand women, how we understand marriage, how we understand relationships between men and women, sex and gender, all of that is a part of this. And we have to understand how all of this works through. Also our theology of ministry. I think sometimes when you hear people push back on the idea of women in leadership, it's not just that they have a poor understanding of women, it's that they have a poor understanding of leadership. They only know how to talk about leadership in a way that's overbearing. Mm -hmm. And as you hear them describe what it would be like to be under a woman in authority, I think, man, I wouldn't want to be under a man in authority yeah. if that's yeah. how they acted. Yeah. That, that's, it's the problem is the way you see authority and what authority looks like in the church. And of course, also, as I mentioned earlier, what view we have of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and the authority of God in calling. And if, if God has the authority to call in a way that doesn't match with our interpretation of Scripture, is it God who calls who's wrong or is it our interpretation of scripture that's wrong? Oh, wow. And that's something that we have to seriously think about. Uh, one other thing I just wanna add, just for the sake of time, I think we also have to consider how people respond to us who disagree mm -hmm. and where they may be coming from. Because I have talked to people who would argue with me on women in ministry who are doing it from the sincerity of their hearts. Mm -hmm and from saying, look, I, I just really believe the Bible says this, and it's coming from a place of, of trying to be biblically faithful. Mm -hmm. And the issue is, is your interpretation here, is it actually leading to a spiritually healthy community? Because that's also part of it. A theology of women in ministry is also a theology of the church mm -hmm. and how we understand that. But uh, I want to give a story here at the end as a way of kind of tying some of this together. I attended a church once. I worked as a pastor at a community that was formed in 1931. And the constitution they wrote in 1931 did not allow women to serve on the board or in pastoral ministry. And so, and they had not changed the constitution since 31. So every year we'd go back to the lead pastor and say, hey, business meeting is coming up. Let's annual business meeting, let's change the constitution. And every year our lead pastor said, no, it's not yet, not yet, not yet. Finally, one year he says, okay, I'll give you 20 minutes with the board to convince them that we need to change the constitution. Now the struggle was this, some of our board members were the grandchildren of the people who wrote the constitution. So I'm actually going in to tell them that their grandparents were wrong in the way that they understood this. So I sat down with the board, I began to make the case, and that 20 minute conversation turned into a two hour conversation where the board continued to ask, they wanted to understand. There was, uh, it was a good faith conversation. And at the end, I could tell I hadn't convinced all the board, but I had convinced the board enough that it was worth bringing to the church. Mm -hmm. And so the way we did it was this, I thought it was done very wise, uh, very wisely. On Sunday morning, I had the service and I was gonna spend the sermon talking about women in ministry and what the Bible says, leading up to telling the church in a month, we're having our business meeting, we're gonna vote on this. Then every Wednesday night for that month, I had a 90 minute town hall meeting where anyone in the church could come, I would make the case again, and then they could ask me anything they wanted to on women in ministry. Some people only came once. Some people thought of a new question every week, and they came back every week to say, hey, I thought of this, I thought of this. By the time we got to our business meeting, I sat down and met with some of the members of the church who belonged to those original founding families. And they said to us, Pastor, they said to me, I want you to know that you have made a strong case we are not convinced, not because we don't think you've made a strong case, we feel like you're asking us to vote against our parents and our grandparents. Wow. And for them, that was too hard an emotional commitment to make. Mm -hmm. They said, but we also see where the church is heading. And for the sake of unity, we've decided to abstain from voting. Mm -hmm. And that night when we took the vote, it was unanimous. Mm -hmm. And that same night, we also elected our first woman to the board. Because as soon as we removed that restriction, everyone in the church said, we know who should be on the board, right? Like, <laughs> this is the person that, that should be in that room. And it, it was just such a healthy way mm 
that things were done. But I had to respect that there were people who disagreed with me who weren't disagreeing with me because they hated women. They were disagreeing with me because of their upbringing, because of the emotional commitments they had, because they had been told all their life, this is the truth. Mm -hmm. And for them, it just felt like a bridge too far. Wow. Yet the maturity of those was to say, we don't want to stand in the way of the rest of the church. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it was still a spiritually healthy decision. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Tennyson. I know that time is catching up to us, but thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Keener. You have elevated the theological awareness and maturity of our fellowship just in this moment of dialogue and conversation. And we are so grateful to the both of you and what you continue to do through scholarship, through your theological counsel and our fellowship and abroad to keep the church of, of Jesus Christ, to keep us leaned into scriptures so that we can continue to be led by biblical precedents. Thank you, Lainey, for being my co-host today. And thank you, friends, for leaning into scripture with us. We pray that the truths, the biblical truths we've considered today, may they shape your lived theology and empower you to transform your community. God bless you.